It's another sophomore effort here at The Poptimist with Renee Denfeld's The Child Finder. I loved her first book, The Enchanted, which included a mute death row inmate that escapes into his fairy tale imaginings while observing the gray, dismal world of the prison around him. With The Child Finder, Denfeld once again leans on the idea of escaping into fable, I'm relying on the bright, optimistic language of make believe and wonder. We're introduced to Madison Cottle. She is five years old when she is out looking for the perfect Christmas tree with her mother and father in the woods of the Skookum National Forest in the mountains of Oregon. She, in her excitement, races on ahead and quickly disappears. The snow is already covering up the track, and that quickly turns into a blizzard. A search party is sent out, comes up empty. Even in the spring, when the cadaver dogs are sent out, they come up with nothing, and that was nearly three years ago. Enter Naomi Cottle. She is the child finder. She's gifted with a singular ability to find missing children when traditional avenues have failed. In her career, she has discovered over 30 different children, but not all of them alive. By the second chapter, we are there when Madison becomes the snow girl, born of brilliant snow. She is plucked from the cold near death by her savior, his face a halo of light. She is slowly nursed back to health in a dugout cellar with dirt walls hidden underneath the floorboards in a cabin deep in the woods. Snow Girl is how Madison delineates her life before with her new horrible reality, and she quickly learns the rules of her new existence. We're there for Naomi Cottle's story as well. She remembers her birth, running naked across a strawberry field at night, escaping from something or someone. All her memories before that moment are completely blanked out, lost to her. Now, if I haven't mentioned, trigger warnings all around. But Denfeld's writing invokes sun-dappled fairy tales. Madison finds solace in her imagination. She was perfection and light, with a body built of frost and air. She nurtures hope. She experienced moments of joy. And I found it so compelling and yet a little strange. I almost want to begrudge Denfeld's treatment of Madison's captivity. I imagine writing this more like the opening credits of Seven, this unnerving soundtrack, Dirty Colors and Madness. But Denfeld writes what she knows. With the Enchanted, she follows a death row investigator. Denfeld's day job is as a death row investigator. With a child finder, she draws on her own personal experience growing up with molestation and abuse. Um, her work helping sex trafficking victims and her current role as a foster mother to three children who survived traumas of their own. Once again, I am in love with the way Denfeld writes, but then the story diverges. Naomi takes on another case while she's working the present one, something unusual for her, and it seems sort of tacked on as far as the story goes. It's this uh, unnecessary tangent that needlessly prolongs the story, and I'm worried that Denfeld isn't going to be able to carry this thing until the end. The ending is great, but that middle section is some tough slogging, sticking with Madison and her captor. And I had a hard time with that middle section, but it may not entirely be the writing's fault. By now, you're probably familiar with everything going on around Harvey Weinstein. He is just the latest in a long string of powerful men abusing their positions of power to prey on women, joining the likes of Bill Cosby, Bill O'Reilly, uh, Roger Ailes, Travis Kalanick, Dove Charney, uh, here in Canada, Gian Gomeshi, and... Oh yeah, the President of the United States. I mean, not to conflate the kidnapping and abuse of a five-year-old child in a work of fiction to the 30 years of systemic sexual harassment and assault by a man in a position of immense power and influence, but it's not like they're in completely different ballparks here. And I can't help but think of a quote commonly attributed to Margaret Atwood. Men are afraid women are going to laugh at them. Women are afraid that men will kill them. It's the sexualization of vulnerability, and it falls an altogether common MO. Men preying on women that are young and powerless, so they're somehow implicated if they say yes, and punished if they say no. Now, Weinstein is in a position of declining power, and those stepping out to speak out against him are no longer young and vulnerable, but it's not like this was a surprise. Sharon Waxman got her expose spiked at the New York Times in 2003. Courtney Love spoke out against Weinstein in 2005. Seth MacFarlane roasted him at the 2013 Oscars, and Pharaoh's piece was killed over at NBC as late as August, even though it would go on to appear in The New Yorker in October. Here in Canada, Gian Gomeshi was a known sexual harasser amongst the Whisper Networks. He was a well-loved host of a national radio show covering arts and culture when he was brought to trial for allegations of sexual harassment and assault. I'd heard stories of Humber College students warned against Gian Gomeshi in case they scored an internship at the CBC, and 
Over at the Canada Land podcast, Sarah Pauly and Jesse Brown talked about how his violent sexual tendencies was reduced to nothing but black humored dinner party gossip years ago. Now, the case against Jan was uh, eventually sent to trial and his accusers were dragged through the mud. Their judgment question, their testimonies poked at. It got to the point where Sarah said that if you found yourself in a similar case as the Gian accusers and you had lawyers who knew and loved you, they would 201 unequivocally tell you not to testify, not to stand up or speak out, that it would be ultimately an impossible, despairing and demoralizing task. When it happened to Sarah, she talks about blocking it out or trying to process it as humor, a story she'll tell her girlfriends, ruefully shaking her head. Um, she remembers sending an ingratiating email to the perpetrator, trying to normalize it. But these are all things that will get called out in court proceedings, things that a lawyer will use to discredit you, to judge you. I mean, I have a daughter. I know she's going to be the victim of sexual harassment. Hell, I've witnessed it already online with her Twitch channel. But to think that she will be a victim of sexual assault is crazy making. The Me Too hashtag has shown how scarily ubiquitous this is. And there does seem to be a groundswell opening the door towards more naming and shaming. But I can't help but think that this is just a blip. Trump is still president. Bill O'Reilly is coming back to Fox. Bill Cosby's case ended in a mistrial. Gian Gameshi was acquitted. Not exactly storybook endings. And maybe that's the goal of Rennie Denfeld with her latest work, that it is motivated to spark discussion. This is reality that she works in every day, and she is far more invested in the nuance of these many elements than I am as a reader of fiction. My need for this tight, unsympathetic story arc is at odds with her need to tell a story that redeems victims, provides hope, and points to bright possibility. This is more than just a story for Rennie Denfeld. This is an acknowledgement of others who have survived, an acknowledgement of her past and the past of her children, and it is a promise of something better. So, I realize this has been a bit of a downer tangent that I've gone on, so you know what? When I get in those places, I find comfort in a cigar, a glass of whiskey, some online poker just to decompress. What about you guys? What do you do? What rituals do you have to find comfort that isn't just reading? I'd love to know in the comments below, but in the meantime, I hope you all have a great week of reading. We'll talk to you soon. Bye.